All right, well, what move? That's not. You turn it down just a hair. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. I appreciate you all being here uh, for this session. My name is Clyde C. Passad. I am the head of the training and certification group at the Linux Foundation. And uh, we spend a lot of our time, actually, all of our time, thinking about talent. Uh, and the role that the people side plays in the broader ecosystem. So LF's a really exciting place to be, right? We have 700 plus open source projects, ton of committed developers, lots of excitement. At the end of the day, still people need to be involved in doing the code, in standing up the systems, in running the systems. And the more and more we're hearing this uh, drumbeat of how are we going to get fully staffed? Where are we going to get fully staffed? Wow, the competition is fierce. You know, I keep losing people out the back as fast as I'm bringing them in the front. And so the, the question is, what, do we, you know, what does the new normal look like, especially as we come out of the pandemic with remote work and remote hiring? And what are the implications for how we think about the talent pool in our industry? And uh, the thing that I got to thinking about last night is uh, it's a little bit like the little red hen. You guys know the story of the little red hen? The little red hen goes around, plants the corn, asks people who wants to help with the corn. Nobody wants to help plant. Time to reap the corn. She asks who's going to help reap the corn. Nobody wants to help. She grinds the corn. Nobody wants to help grind the corn. She bakes the bread. Nobody wants to help break the bread. When time comes to eat the bread, a whole bunch of people show up. Like, hey, bread! Talents like that, right? I think we've got, all gotten a little bit lazy that we kind of show up and it's like, oh, talent! Uh, <laughs> and it's just not true anymore. Right? I mean, it's never really been true, right? I, uh, I keep joking with folks, uh, and it's sort of gotten to be not funny, actually, that you know, if, you, if you're feeling bored, even if you're in some random field, just put the word Kubernetes on your LinkedIn profile and give it 12 hours. And all kinds of interesting inquiries will start popping up for you. Uh, and that's just the reality of the world we live in, right? Everybody is on the hunt. But like the little red hen, we all want the bread kind of fully baked. You know, it's sort of like, well, I prefer to have somebody with three years experience and just slide them in. It's like, well. If you can find that person, that is fantastic. And if you can afford that person, that is even better. And if they're still here 12 months from then, well, congratulations. <laughs> you know, it's like winning the lottery. Uh, you know, talent is really a, a serious thing. And I think the thesis of this talk is sort of life lessons from the little red hen is we need to do more to kind of build the talent, right? This idea that you just go out and, and source it on the market. Uh, it's never really been true, but it's less true now than it, it even used to be. I, I guess I, I, I want to stop there before I go too much further. Um, is anybody in the audience seeing anything different? I mean, you know, we have a view, we've done some surveys, we have some data. Uh, any different perspectives on talent, especially given the pullback in the markets in the past? Several weeks? No? no? Nobody stumbling into giant untapped pools of talent out there? Uh, look, the talent shortage is real. You guys have seen the stats. 93% of hiring managers say they're having a tough time. 100% of the people I've talked to at this conference have said, hmm, yeah, not so easy, uh, especially to get the talent we want on some. Uh, it's tough enough on the, on the core stack of, you think of sort of public cloud infrastructure. When you start digging into that for you know, uh, edge networks, IoT, uh, AI, machine learning, you know, the deeper you get, the harder it gets, right? And so even at the basic level of cloud native familiarity, there's not enough. And the more, the more specialized you get into your particular application, the, the tougher it actually gets to actually find what you want. Um, and then, of course, unemployment is, is low. You know, they, they, there's cutbacks. We're seeing cutbacks. At, and this morning, I saw Netflix did another cutback. You know, th there's definitely some shedding of talent happening. 
I don't think uh, it, it's very unlikely that we end up in a situation where there's so much cut back on technical talent that there's a whole ton of people looking for jobs and, and life suddenly gets easier and we can all staff up every open rec. I think that's very unlikely to happen just given the extent to which people are trying to pull talent into the market. Uh, and it is a global talent shortage. This is one of the really dramatic shifts, I think, uh, over the past 18 to 24 months. A lot of companies have gotten comfortable with this idea that they can hire talent that's away from sort of the core office site. And that's great news if you're not in the Bay Area or Bangalore or Chicago or Dublin or one of the sort of big centers, because you too can now tap into some of those great salaries that have been available. And people are looking and, and are willing to consider you as a part of that talent pool. Uh, the bad news is everybody discovered this simultaneously. <laughs> so the, the idea that you can go pick off talent in some of these uh, you know, historically sort of lower temperature markets uh, is exactly not true. And if you look at you know, the, what the chart represents is the percentage of people who feel comfortable that they've planned for their talent needs out uh, through the next 10 years. And of course, the answer is very few people have done that, in part because very few people have really started to think about how am I going to build some of this talent? How am I going to put some skin in the game to help grow that next generation of talent instead of kind of harvesting it all uh, at the end? Um, and the current pipelines are just not big enough, right? If you look at the folks who are coming out of degree programs, associate programs, whether you look at it at the US level, whether you look at it at the global level, there's just really not enough coming out of that sort of traditional talent development pipeline. Uh, and that's before you get to the question of are the people coming out of the traditional pipeline ready to work in a microservices, cloud first, uh, a couple of head shaking. No, I, I, uh, the first week I came to the Linux Foundation, my uh, wife is a professor here at UT Austin, and, and I asked her to make an introduction to the head of the computer science department, kind of rolled in and said, hey, you know, what are you guys thinking in terms of how you modify the curriculum? in the age of you know, open source sort of coming into its own and Linux as operating systems. And he sort of rocked back in his chair and said, well, here's the thing. By the time we teach the things we need to teach to stay accredited, it takes all four years. And when we ask around, nobody wants a five-year degree. So we teach the things we need to teach to stay accredited, and we hope the students fill in the blanks with the other stuff that they need the first day they go to the job. And I remember leaving the office thinking, wow, that is kind of scary. They know they're not teaching what, what people want them to see day one on the job, but they're stuck in this accreditation sort of treadmill where they can't get off, and it takes years and years I actually recently went back and met with the new head of computer science, and sadly the story is unchanged because my question was, well, it's been eight years. Have you guys updated the standards for accreditation? And uh, so there's two problems, right? There's a, the people coming out of the formal education pipeline aren't necessarily getting the breadth of exposure. And I'm generalizing. There's some places, you know, Portland State and others that do a really nice job trying to integrate uh, open source into the curriculum and the day-to-day -day experience. But as a generalization, the formal programs aren't doing a great job and the informal programs are not coordinated, right? They're not, they're, there's not a really good pipeline sort of coming in. So there is kind of this global uh, challenge of where's the supply going to come from of folks who are experienced in working in these technologies and, and have comfortable, uh, comfortable working in technologies. All of which means that, the, you know, the easy things to do, which is what have we done before that has worked? Uh, you know, I made the joke about LinkedIn earlier. It's not really a joke. <laughs> People on LinkedIn has become just a circular firing squad for hiring, right? You find somebody great, somebody else finds one of your people great, and you just basically do the musical chairs thing and sort of round and round, right? And meanwhile, you're paying the recruiter, what, how many months of salary to go find that person? It's like, yeah, $100,000 between the finder's fee and the onboarding fee, and then you, you know, by the time they show up, somebody else is gone and you start the whole uh, cycle again. It's just, 
Yeah, LinkedIn was great. I remember when it first came out and everybody was like, oh, it's so awesome. I can go find talent in places that I've never fished before. Um, you know, everybody else figured it out. So <laughs> not, not a great hidden gem anymore. Uh, word of mouth is great. Um, you know, I'll talk about this a little bit later. I think people could do more of that. Um, traditional degree programs, uh, you know, there's only so many grads coming out of these things and there's a bunch more companies trying to compete for them, even if you go to some of the areas globally and, you know, across North America, in our case where uh, maybe the, uh, the big tech offices have not been, it just, it's tapped out, right? It really is tapped out in terms of where you're gonna get talent from, from those pools coming in. And so what do you do, right? What do you do differently tomorrow than you're doing today? Because, yeah, we all have projects we're trying to do, including us at the Linux Foundation. And then we look at the open recs and we think, oh man, if only we could fill those three recs, like we could actually dent this backlog and get some of the roadmap stuff accelerated. But uh, you know, the other challenge, of course, is the people who you have need to be fully deployed working against the backlog, who's gonna interview? <laughs> who's gonna like, you know, spend hours combing through? The last position we opened, 12 hours later, there were 84 applicants. And I'm looking at the hiring manager saying, so the good news is you have 84 applicants. The bad news is you have 84 applicants. <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but somebody's gotta comb through you know, the, the stash and figure out kind of, you know, who you're even going to bring in, right? And, you know, you all know, like, interviewing is not like a half an hour process, right? It's multiple people. It's, just, you know, it's a multi-hour commitment times 10 candidates. It's just, it's a lot of investment, right? It's a lot of investment in dollars and time. And then, you know, did you actually fill the gap or in, in the three months it took you, did you lose somebody else to the team, right? So it is a, it's a really tough treadmill. Um, so one of the questions is, can you, can you buy your way out of it? You know, so uh, it's interesting with the, uh, the data and, you know, the 10th jobs report came out, we announced it here at this event. We've done, you know, this was sort of the hot off the press research, couple thousand people responding and people have raised pay. And, you know, I show of hands whose companies have raised pay in the past 12 months or so. Um, it's one of these things, it's sort of like necessary but not sufficient, right? Because we've all raised pay, so it didn't really make a dent. Uh, it helped stanch the bleeding a little bit, but it didn't move the ball really forward. And you know, it was interesting because we've been doing the survey for 10 years now, and uh, it, people had always been a little bit coy when we asked the individual side of the survey where pay ranked it was always sort of like number two or number three. And I always looked at the data and thought, mm, is it really though? This year it was number one and I'm not even pretending anymore. Like pay is important, uh, but it's not gonna be sufficient because you know, unless you have an awesome VC just pouring money into your gas tank, you cannot outbid the market for talent and use that as your sustainable strategy for uh, filling the needs you have. It's just. Uh, yeah, the tide has kind of risen with it, and so your know, base is going to go up, but it's not really going to be a lever. Um, but it is something you're going to have to talk about. It is something you're going to have to do, uh, but it's probably not going to be a major part of your solution to just say, well, I'll just pay more and, and, and bring these folks in because the, everybody else is doing it, um, and including in some of these untapped markets, right? So again, yeah. We're hiring, and, and we had a candidate who is in a pretty low-cost rural part of the country, and uh, he sent in his expectations, and I thought, can I get my head around paying somebody? You know, I mean, the Bay Area I get, right? You're sharing with 12 guys in an apartment for three grand a month. <laughs> but you know, even in the low-cost areas, right? Pe people know, they know what talent is being paid, right? So there isn't a lot of arbitrage opportunities going on. Uh, there's still pockets, you know, you hear, you know, well, before recent events, you know, Ukraine had a lot of developers. I think they're all in Turkey now. Um, the Poland's got a lot. You've got some pockets in South America. So there are places where there's a little more momentum um, building, Belize, Costa Rica. But there's just not a ton of those places, right, where you can kind of arbitrage out the salary. It's just, you know, pay is just is really uh, not enough. And it's all of the above, you know. It's 
sorry, this font is a little small, but it's flex work, it's training the talent, it's providing bonuses, end of year bonuses, spot bonuses, productivity bonuses for getting targets and getting projects out on time, encouraging people to spend time on code development, right? And you know, rewarding people who make commits upstream to a project. You know, what it really speaks to is a, what we call the all of the above strategy, right? You, you have to try a little bit of everything and you have to be mindful of the relationship side of it, right? Do you understand what makes the different folks tick? Because some people might prefer the flexibility more, some people might need the pay, somebody else might have be super passionate about an open source project they're contributing to. Uh, you, you really have to, and this is, I think, one of the challenges, right? I think for uh, HR and for engineering leaders and for software development leaders, uh, I will generalize and say that it's not always been the highest sort of EQ in terms of working with folks and understanding what makes them tick. Uh, but, but it's going to be important, understanding what makes the different folks tick and being able to do some adjustments as you go to try to make sure that this person who has this set of priorities is getting their needs met, and this person who has a different set of priorities is getting their needs met. Uh, you know, it's an investment in that relationship, right? And so getting to know the folks, getting to understand what makes them tick, having some flexibility in what you offer them instead of the, you know, here's the deal, everybody gets it, we're all off on Friday, we're all getting quarterly bonuses. You know, the more you invest in the individuals and understanding what it's gonna take to keep them happy, the one thing I can guarantee you is they're gonna get job offers, right? And the other thing I can guarantee you is you're not gonna have 100% retention. There's just no universe. All the loyalty and all the relationship building in the world is not gonna make it so that people don't leave because they get a phenomenal offer from somewhere else. Uh, what you gotta do is figure out, okay, I can't be at 100%. I don't want to be at 10%. And so what are the steps I can take to get my retention from 10 to 20 to 50 to 60 and keep nudging it up? You know, if you can hang on to your folks and you know, you're getting 80% retention year over year, you're probably going to be in the top quartile in the industry in terms of retaining your talent right, and growing your talent. And so you have to be realistic because you're going to have turnover and you're going to have people go for great opportunities somewhere else. But it's a numbers game, right? You have to plan for the fact that people are gonna turn over. And if you think about what that means for your talent pipeline is you have to have a bigger base of talent kind of coming into the organization, which is challenging because one of the things I said at the start I think is true, which is we all wanna hire that guy or gal who's got a bunch of experience and it'd be great, but we're probably gonna hire, have to hire two or three guys and gals that are a little bit more junior and invest in them over a period of time, right? Just the patience of saying it's gonna, you know, you know, it depends on the individual, right? It might take three months before they start being productive. It might take six months, depending on, on where in the cycle they came in. But you have to commit to that, you know, you'll see the last slide which says it's a marathon, not a, not a sprint, right? It's just, it's a, day after day, just deep commitment to getting more talent into the organization. And, and by the way, not just more talent in, discovering the talent that you might already have, right? People who might be in your organization, not necessarily in a technical role. Can you guide them into a technical role, right? That at least you know they're a known quantity, they understand the company culture. So, you know, really thinking about the talent pool, and I think that might be my next. Uh, I'll have one more slide, I'll get there. You know, everybody's thinking anew, right? You know, the, the, one of the side effects of the pandemic was people had a lot of time to think about what are they doing with their life? What's life like when I'm not commuting to work? Uh, you know, uh, you know what, what gets me up and excited out of bed in the morning? And I think in tech, it hasn't been the great resignation that we've seen in the service sector where just tons of people left and are just never coming back but they are re-evaluating. They are suddenly telling us pay is the most important thing. They are saying that they want flexibility in their hours. They wanna be able to maybe work and discover new technologies. They maybe wanna go work on a project they're passionate about. Uh, you know, it, it, this is not yesterday's talent pool. <laughs> this is today's talent pool and, and they're a little more insistent about what, you know, what, what scratches their itches. 
Um, and so, you know, for those of us running departments, driving, hiring, what are we going to do differently? You know, I think, you know, it's the old definition of insanity is you do the same thing and expect a different result. If you do the same thing, the results will get worse and worse over time, right? Because everybody else is going to start to figure out how they're adjusting their strategies on talent. And so for all of you in the room and all your organizations and, and folks joining online, what, you know, what's the all of the above strategy that says, yeah, you can't stop doing the things you were doing last year and two years ago, right? You still have to be on campus recruiting. You still have to be trying on LinkedIn. You still have to be getting job fairs and coming to events. Like, it's not that any of that stops. It's that you do that plus you do all these other things to try to figure out how can I get some more talent into my organization, right? It is all hands on deck, fire up the afterburners because you know there's going to be some attrition, right? So you've got to keep fill in the bottom of the organization and getting talent in knowing that you're not going to keep all of it and developing skills in-house. You know, this is, now I say this somewhat selfishly because that's what we spend our time on is training, but the reality is it's like the little red hen, right? You got to plant it, you got to nurture it, you got to grow it, you got to figure out what does that model look like with internships, with people coming out of high school, with folks coming out, you know, we are military veterans, you know, you really have to think about all the potential sources of talent and how can you get them into your organization. What's the coaching piece going to look like, right? Who's going to mentor the folks if they're coming in with less experience, right? So now you're asking more of the people within the organization that, you know, that could have been flat out, you know, pizza under the door working on code and now say, hey, I need you to spend time training this person and helping, uh, helping them get up to speed. But if everybody is not part of the solution, you're going to be, you know, the hole just keeps getting deeper, right? And so this is not, this is not an exercise in, hey, HR, you're doing a crap job. <laughs> go, go do a better job of finding me talent, right? Every technical person in the organization, in addition to their technical duties, is now a recruiter, is now a developer, is now a trainer. Because you just, how are you going to get there otherwise, right? If you don't build some of your own talent, if you don't go to the, you know, the, the help desk or the call center and see those folks who are sort of geeking out and say, hey, you know, why don't you come do a rotation in this department? Let's see if you've got the potential to, to train up on this, right? If you don't go to the local high school and try to get some of those folks in the robotics club, if you don't go to, you know, the, uh, the workforce adjustment offices for people who are looking for jobs and try to get those folks in, uh, you know, you're never going to tap into that, that broad base and the, the responsibility to develop some of your own, to build your own talent, right? It's kind of, you know, it's, it's the IKEA model. Right? So, it's a lot of steps, right, to assemble the couch, but ain't nobody going to come do it for you. You're going to have to figure out what are we doing on training? You know, what can I do with things like certifications to demonstrate that they actually have developed the skills that I, have, that, that I was asking for? Um, and who's going to be responsible? And the answer is we're all responsible, right? We're, you know, even the junior person <laughs> is going to have to then bring the next more junior person along because they just went through it last year in terms of how you're engaging with folks, how are you pulling people kind of into the talent pipeline. Um, the training, 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 right? Training in non-traditional audience, which, yeah, look, the reality is when you go to your existing workforce and you say, hey, I need your help bringing these folks in and helping to coach them, uh, there's going to be eyes rolling. Right? People are busy. They have projects due. But if everybody doesn't pitch in, it just gets harder and harder, right? And so it's a change from a cultural perspective. It's a change in the expectations we have of our technical teams that their responsibility is to help bring that next generation of talent along. This is not an HR problem. This is not a, hey, I just need a better recruiting firm problem. This is not a, hey, if only management would let me raise my salaries problem. This is a all hands on deck, everybody pull every lever problem because it's the only way you're going to get to something like fully staffing to be able to work on your roadmaps. And yes, it's a cultural expectation change that everybody is mentoring and training somebody else. It's a cultural expectation change that everybody who is a manager is now be expected to spend a little bit more time with every employee figuring out 
what can we do to, to build loyalty? What can we do to build retention? You know, what would make this person happier than where they are today that might be different than what would make this person happier than where we are today? You know, it's a much more engaged future if we're gonna get to where we need to get to in terms of the talent pool. Um, I'll talk some about this, right? Just find it. Yeah. In fact, I'd love to get these, you know, these are some that come up in conversation. And you know, folks in this room might have other perspectives on you know, where to go find that next generation of talent. Uh, is, is anybody doing anything non-traditional in terms of how you try to identify talent pools? Boys and girls clubs, I don't know. Is any, any thoughts from the audience on other ways to identify the next generation of talent? If not, here's a list you could start from. Right? <laughs> uh, you know, geography matters less and less. Uh, I think, has everybody, show of hands, has your organization been doing more remote post pandemic? Pretty much everybody. Um, my wife's an engineering professor, and at the start of the pandemic, she was like, oh, no, I just can't do it. You know, these are engineers. They have to, like, work on the lab. And now she's going in two days a week. Uh, everybody, you know, <laughs> people who said it was absolutely impossible have realized that, well, actually, it's not absolutely impossible. And by the way, traffic's a lot lighter in Austin <laughs> because not everybody is coming in every day. And so on the days you come in, it's actually more pleasant because... My guesstimate is people are doing three days a week in the office for the ones who are coming in. Um, but it doesn't matter where they are anymore, right? You can, you can really go tap some of those talent pools. You can really think about, you know, we're all, we're all doing pipeline-based work now. So if people are doing real-time commits into your integration pipeline, does it matter even which country or which time zone they're in? You know, in fact, there's something to be said for a follow the sun model on development. Um, and it's always been true, right? The big organizations have always done that, right? They've had teams across, um, you know, Europe, Asia, the Americas. Smaller organizations can do that. I mean, we're a relatively small organization as the, as the foundation, right? Just over 300 people. And our engineering team is, for training, is some in the Americas, some in Europe, some in Asia. And we gripe about time zones, and we have to do meetings at 10 o'clock at night because it's early in Japan. But Guess what? That's the new normal. Right? It's like, if you can get great talent, take it. And if it means there's the odd 5 o'clock a.m. call and the odd 10 p.m. call, that's just kind of what you got to do, right? <laughs> you find the talent where you can find them uh, and leverage your networks. Right? I think uh, most companies have you know, um, referral bonuses and things like that. I'm not sure how heavily they lean. Does your company have a referral bonus? Um, is it heavily used? <laughs> Lean into it, right? <laughs> so, uh, the, uh, I know it's true for us as an organization. You know, uh, the, the resumes I read first are the referred ones because I at least know that somebody who understands the organization's culture, who understands this person has a relationship with, with them, is kind of vetting that, they, that there might be a good fit there, right? I think those those re, uh, relationship-based referrals are awesome. And, one of the benefits when you expand your geographic footprint is you now start getting referrals in country. We're about to hire somebody else in Manila that came from a Manila person that we recruited about six months ago in a different department. And you know, she was looking at the board, she saw it and she said, oh, actually, I know somebody who might be a good fit for this role in actually a different part of the organization. It's a great way to, to kind of get those tentacles reaching out further and further into some non-traditional um, talent pools. Uh, and nurture the relationships, right? I think from a cultural change perspective, I imagine this is going to be the heaviest lift. <laughs> Getting every engineer, every developer to think about themselves as part of the talent generation solution is a pretty different place than where most organizations have been. Um, but everybody grab an oar. <laughs> I think that's kind of where we're at is, yeah, it, we're all going to have to jump in and help paddle this thing because yeah, it's a little red hen analogy. You can't show up at the end. We've got to build, build, build the talent in-house, non-traditional sources to supplement what we've been doing. Otherwise, we're going to just keep having open recs and we're going to keep having roadmaps that, that can't be delivered uh, in the time that we'd like to be able to deliver them or you know, bugs in the code that we can't remediate or customer satisfaction issues that we can't get to because all the code in the world 
isn't sufficient. <laughs> we're still, yeah, until the machines come for us, we're still very much dependent on people to get a lot of the stuff done. And there's just not enough people to go around. Um, one last point on uh, diversity. This also came up in the, um, in the survey, right? The, pretty much every organization has a diversity and inclusion policy. Um, are you really living it, right? Because especially the younger cohort, that they're, they're very tuned in to, they come to a staff meeting and they're looking around the table. They come to a Zoom meeting and they're looking at the, the, the thumbnails, right? The, the better you do on some of these dimensions, particularly for that younger workforce, the more it's gonna get noticed. I know it's true for my kids who, you know, my teenager is dialed in to like every room of like, hey, is this a representative audience? And so as you're bringing that new talent pool in, it's more than lip service, right? You, you, the, the, the more representative your, uh, your talent pool is of the community that people live in, the more likely you are to be successful in conveying those people kind of into the organization. So, you know, it's not a slogan, right? It's a lifestyle. <laughs> the, the bigger we open the funnel at the top, you know, we know there's gonna be breakage as we go through, so we gotta make that as wide as possible to get talent in because that's the only way we end up with enough senior and mid-level talent within our organizations over the long term. Um, strap in, right? <laughs> this is not changing. It, you know, it, it might actually get more intense uh, as more and more, you know, I give the analogy all the time. The, at the start of the pandemic, uh, we had this great uh, little Chinese restaurant close by where we live and the guy worked in the back and the lady stood up front and took orders and she would actually write the orders down by hand and she had one of these little pulley things and she'd clip it on and she'd send the pulley back. And they closed during the pandemic and when they reopened, they had a website and with ordering, online ordering. So next time I went in, I said, Chen Shi, like, when do you guys get like a web ordering and fulfillment system? And she's like, well, was the only way we could reopen because the customers didn't actually want to come in and sit around waiting for the orders to be ready. And so we found a guy who was specializing in standing up online ordering systems for small restaurants and we paid him you know, 15 grand and he put it in and now we're all using it. So, you know, she's now an e-commerce business. <laughs> At one point, they, weren't, they were only taking cash when they first opened, right? So, you know, that business is now an e-commerce business with a technical solution partner. So, yeah, the 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 usage base footprint has expanded, which is part of the reason that the talent uh, you know, war has, has gotten worse, right? Because you know, uh, Asia Cafe is now an online business. This <laughs> blows my mind, but you know, multiply that by tens of thousands or millions of use cases, right? It's just a, a ton of use for the, for the, especially for some of these cloud-based type technologies. So you know, we're, we're in it, grab an oil and start rowing. That's all I had, guys. Um, any? Questions, comments? I recently had an experience where I interviewed 20 interns to uh, do some embezzling sort of thing, and uh, the, uh, the results were not great. Unfortunately, I didn't have very good material to point them at to say, here's what I do this, come back to me after. So then my question to you is, like, when is it sounds like you never thought about So uh, yes, a, a lot of we do a ton of stuff for free today, right? So we've had over two million people take free training courses in the last several years, and some of our paid catalog is also available under a CCBY license, so that people can reuse it. I think our bigger challenge is people don't know we have a training arm. Um, Linux Academy doesn't exist, and people still mistake us for Linux Academy. <laughs> it's just, uh, you know, LF as an organization has been known for code for so long that I think we, we're still not on people's radar as a source for, um, for talent development material because uh, a, a lot of our introductory stuff is super popular, right? Like the basics, like introduction to Linux, introduction to Kubernetes. Uh, we have one called introduction to cloud infrastructure, which is basically a giant glossary of all these terms that people hear thrown around, right? Unikernels and microservices and pipelines. Uh, and, you know, we're open to more ideas for other topics that would be helpful. We're doing one right now. Tim, who's our director of training, is doing a course on what is quantum computing and why should you care? 
<laughs> to, you know, to, to try to create more awareness and on ramps, right? So on ramps for people to be able to discover these technologies. So tell your friends, like, go to training.org. There's, uh, there's a ton of uh, free resources in there. And if there's other resources that we could be developing that would be helpful, we're always happy to, to listen because yeah, our whole goal as a group is how do we make sure that lack of people isn't the reason that great code gets used and deployed and built on? And so we're constantly looking for what are ways to break some of those trade-offs. And part of, the, part of what we're trying to do uh, with awareness with these types of sessions is get the, the developer and user communities to be more engaged and helping to grow some of their own talent. Like, you know, there's a piece we can play and uh, you know, from a relationship building perspective and from a career coaching perspective, a lot of that's gonna have to happen you know, at the cold face where people work. There's another question back here. I'll bring you, sorry, I'll bring you a mic so the virtual participants Oh, oh yes, thank you. Well. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for your presentation. It was very insightful. Uh, so my question is, do you think this is going to be a um, problem that becomes worse and becomes a cycle as it gets worse? Because just as people started, just, just as everybody started uh, doing the LinkedIn route, um, as people start pulling all the levers they see here, um, and start raising the bar of expectations across the board. At the same time, I don't think we see the demand for talent ever decreasing. In fact, just probably always increasing because of the pace of innovation and adoption of open source technologies. Um, I guess, do, do you see that cycle happening and getting worse? Well, I think what's gonna happen is the same thing that's happened, that has always happened in technology, which is places get reputations as great places to work because they've got great technologies or they've got a great sort of position in the market. Uh, if you go back even five years, nobody was asking, is the culture of this organization great? They were asking, what's the stock options look like and how underwater are they? <laughs> they were asking, does this look good on my resume so I could go jump to the next thing? More and more, I think people are asking through the pandemic, is this a place I will be happy working? And so, you know, there's no happiness index that say that your people are better, you know, are happier here than there. If, if the, I think the, the key thing will be, does your organization have a great reputation as a place to work? And, you know, the better that reputation is, the more likely you are to be able to bring talent in and, and hang on to it. Um, other places will also be great places to work. So, you know, it probably is true. Like, it's always been that the bar will continue to raise. But it's also true that, the sooner you get an enhanced reputation, the longer that reputation has been out in the market, the, the, you, know, you, you, you are able to maintain, to, in some extent you're able to maintain kind of brand equity if you're the first ones there, if you're early ones there. Um, so uh, unfortunately, yes, it's probably gonna continue to be tight, but the, the sooner you start investing in, because what this is is basically your reputation as, as an employer and a place to work, right? And how, how broad you can open the fund and how welcoming you can be, how much you're investing in giving people a talent development experience that they couldn't have anywhere else. And the better that story is and the longer that story has been happening, the more likely you are, you know, success breeds success, right? Sorry, there's another question here. Uh, yeah, thank you for an excellent talk. Um, I work at a university, which traditionally doesn't pay as excellently as uh, a lot of other people at the conference. Um, but uh, historically, the benefits have been amazing. And even for myself, like, you know, I was able to leverage that tuition benefit. Um, so I'm just wondering, do you see benefits? I mean, you know, you talked a little bit about that, but is that a, a really a large portion of what offerings could be? Yeah, I, I think it gets back to this idea that, uh, it's, a, it's a, uh, a menu of things, right? So people clearly are saying now that pay is more important, where they used to maybe be a little hesitant to say pay is important, but it's not always the most important. And I will say, look at Linux Foundation, for example, because you know what we don't have? Stock options, <laughs> we're a nonprofit. And so you, know, you think about in re, you know, pulling tech uh, talent in without stock options feel like a, feels like a, a bit like a hand tied behind your back, certainly the public sector. Uh, I know uh, we have had discussions with lots of public sectors from different countries, including you know, things like you know, uh, departments of defense, and they think, oh, 
I'm not really at the top of people's lists of a place to go to work to be you know, a great tech environment, but if you can have you know, the mission of the organization as part of something that draws people in, if you can have other benefits that draws people in, you know, and if you can invest in building those relationships and getting some of those non-traditional non talent pools in, you know, you gotta fight with what you have, right? <laughs> and, and that, you know, if, if pay is a limit, and, and in the public sector, it, 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 sometimes it's limited by statute, right? <laughs> There's only so much you can do. There's formal pay skills, then you gotta go lean heavily on the other elements. Sorry, one question in the back. Thank you. Um, yeah, sorry, I'm still like formulating this in my head. Um, I guess uh, a question that I have is like, if you're having like, like let's say you're in a position of like uh, being a manager and you help or you're helping advocate for your team to get like raises and stuff like that. Um, if you like kind of building off of uh, the last question that was asked, um, like if you're having a conversation with them an employee where they're like referencing, well, like, oh, if I go to Amazon or I go to Microsoft, they're willing to pay me like X amount, and you've already implemented all of those incentives. Is there a strategy? Like, do you have you found that there's a strategy to bring those people back into the fold and like help them realize the benefits and difference in culture? Or if, if an employee has already made up their mind that like pay is what's like deciding their uh, willingness to stay, is that just like kind of a write off at that point? Yeah, it's a challenging question, right? It, and if, if it gets to the point where you're hearing about it for the first time when they've gotten another great offer, you're maybe a little bit late to the game, right? So this part of this whole spiel of invest in building relationships with employees is, is to try to have that conversation six months before right. to be able to say, well, you know, if we get you cross-trained on some of these IoT technologies, I could justify a pay increase for you. Mm -hmm. Right, and so, you know, and, and the flip side of that is it's a lot easier to go to your manager or your manager's manager and, uh, and advocate for pay adjustments if you can also say, I'm, I'm asking for this because this person is now competent on this new piece of technology and implemented it on this roadmap item, right? And so, you know, yes, the, the training of the talent is, is important for you to get done what you want to get done, but it also actually then reinforces your ability as somebody responsible for that group to be able to advocate for them to say, hey, we need you know, more pay or we need some different type of benefit because they now have the skill that they did not have 12 months ago, right? And they've been able to deliver this value to the business. And so part of your responsibility is getting in early and figuring out what they're interested in and how can you provide that that opportunity to learn that new skill. Because as a generalization, people who work in tech like learning new stuff. They get excited about this new tool, this new you know, opportunity to develop something cool. And so what, you know, historically we've, we've sort of asked the employee to drive. And not everybody's confident enough to go to their boss to say, hey, I need, it, you know, I need to go two days to, to take this course to learn it. Uh, if you open the doors of that conversation and you open that door a few months before the, hey, I got this great Amazon offer, your chances are a lot better than, I got this great Amazon offer, what can you do for me? Because at that point, it's, you know, you're, 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 you're in very transactional yeah. type mode, but if you're able to say, oh, well, you know what? Finish this project so you can develop this new skill we've been working on, and I'm gonna try to put in for a raise for you. Now you've got better odds. Yeah, perfect, thank you so much. Okay, so I think we're about out of time here. So if you do have a question, you guys can talk in the Find hall, me in whatever. The yeah, but thank you so much. All right, thank you all.